lives and works in St. Louis and Philadelphia and is a professor and chair of the studio art department in the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Art at Washington University. His work has been exhibited and collected internationally, and as I said, is currently on display at the Courier Museum in the ongoing exhibition, Open World Video Games and Contemporary Art. Um, please join me virtually in giving a round of applause and welcoming Tim Portlock. Tim. Thank you for that very nice introduction. <clears throat> and thanks for uh, inviting me to give a talk on my work uh, and participating in the exhibition at the Courier. Um, I hope to someday visit to see in person. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to, should I share, should start sharing my screen, is that okay? So I'm gonna share some images. Um, so I'm gonna talk about my work, uh, so just give a sense of the ideas that I'm dealing with uh, in creating the work that's in the Courier Museum. And I think that it's kind of easiest to go kind of chronologically through the current body of work I'm doing to help people understand um, what I'm work working with. Uh, I'm trying to go into full screen mode, sorry. <clears throat> so as uh, Samantha uh, pointed out in, in my introduction, uh, most of my uh, uh, training is actually as a painter. Uh, and then <clears throat> I have an undergrad and graduate degree in, in painting actually. And for 10 years after I had uh, my painting MFA, I, I did support myself as a muralist. And I also made a painting, a studio-based painting meant to go into a art gallery, art museum kind of context. And <clears throat> um, about 10 years after that, I became very interested in technology through the internet. Like in the late 90s, I was really fascinated by how the internet was able to combine um, both a public and a more specialized kind of audience for my art. And, um, and, and then through a series of different phases I went through as a digital artist, I ended up um, making art with um, 3D computer game technology. Um, so right around the time I relocated to Philadelphia, I started uh, playing around with this program called Maya, which is a software that's used for the visual effects uh, and computer, uh, visual effects, Hollywood film and computer game industry. And <clears throat> I had lived in several different cities in like really quick succession. So I kind of felt like a connoisseur what was particular to each city. So when I moved to this city, which is based, the, the image that you're seeing now is based on Philadelphia, which I had recent, recently relocated to. Um, I was really impressed by or struck by the volume of empty and abandoned buildings in the city. And um, I had no other kind of like association with Philadelphia before moving there, except for like the Liberty Bell and things like that. So <clears throat> I started to make these landscape images based on the empty and abandoned buildings um, that existed in my general neighborhood in Philadelphia. Um, oftentimes what I do is I would ride my bike or drive my car around the neighborhoods and sort of identify buildings that looked empty uh, or abandoned and photograph them and then use my technology to recreate a digital version of those buildings. And so I have, I, I always show this image because it helps people to understand a little bit the technology I'm working with. I think oftentimes I like will explain all this stuff verbally and people still think I work with Photoshop. Um, so <clears throat> once I make a number of these buildings, I, um, I sort of have like an asset library or a building library. <clears throat> and once I reach a critical mass of buildings in that library, I'll start to organize these buildings into city blocks. And then I'll start to put together multiple city blocks until I have a city. <clears throat> so another thing that really influenced the development of this work has just been my long-term interest in landscape painting. Uh, <clears throat> I, I've sort of had like a recent, uh, I would say a creative anniversary 
a creative 10 year anniversary where like rethinking sort of like what has motivated me um, to be an artist and make work. And I recently re-remembered that actually one of the things was um, reading like just really fundamental canonical African-American literature where the protagonist explores a city um, <clears throat> as a form of like self-realization. And <clears throat> that also led me to interest in sort of the landscape genre, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so I've, I've just had this like long-term interest in like the landscape for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but for the work that I'm doing now, I'm specifically interested in the Hudson River Valley School of American Landscape Painting. And so one of the things that really interests me is like the idea of this first generation of American artists being very conscious of being newly American artists and trying to formulate an identity about Americanness and, com as a, and, and communicating that through visual conventions. So they were constructing visual conventions to communicate a sense of Americanness. But <clears throat> a lot of these notions are um, really sort of uh, tied up with ideas that we now call manifest destiny, um, ideas about American exceptionalism and et cetera. So I, I'm showing these two images in particular because uh, this is mine and this is the historic painter Thomas Cole. And so this is a painting that I like really closely reference and I model my own image after. And I'm trying to set up a, a dialogue between these two images um, to talk about um, how America has changed and have not changed and how maybe our perceptions of America um, it's remained kind of stagnant. So in, in this image, uh, Thomas Cole, uh, well, Thomas Cole revered nature. Um, he was a, a sort of a subgroup of the Hudson River Valley School that was actually had, a, actually had a lot of anxiety about the industrialization of the American landscape. And so one of the most common ways this image is interpreted is that it's, uh, it communicates a sense of foreboding about the landscape being um, uh, transformed by human presence. So on the right side, uh, or our right side of the painting, we can see like nature that wilderness has been converted into farmland. And then on the left, you see uh, wilderness that's in the process of being tamed or destroyed, depending on your perspective. Um, and then in my image, it's sort of the opposite of that. So this image is about the anxiety that's generated about the deindustrialization of the American landscape that existed in places like Philadelphia and Detroit and Cleveland and many, many other smaller towns, Akron, um, places in between St. Louis and, and, and the Northeast. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I'm also take a cue from uh, this group of painters is that their images for a lot of people well, they use, they use, for a lot of people, they are using the conventions of realism, which is meant to uh, uh, imbue their images with this sense of authoritativeness, right? So they may be taking a lot of creative license with the subject matter, but for people looking at these images, they're taking these as like realistic depictions of the places that um, they're, they're titled after. So like a lot of their images are named after specific places and oftentimes they do roughly correspond to those real places, but they take liberties so that to imbue nature with these American qualities that they thought were important to communicate to a broad public, American citizenry and also uh, foreign, foreign citizens. Uh, so I'm also taking a lot of creative liberties. So a lot of the buildings in my, um, work actually do exist, but I'm, I'm moving them around in places so that they are next to things that they aren't in the real world um, uh, to make uh, specific points about life in contemporary urban space and how that relates to or doesn't relate to the sort of broader narrative about uh, America that we uh, uh, received from the earlier generations of American artists. So this, this body of work is based on Philadelphia where I was living 
full time at for several years. Um, and when I was making this work, this roughly corresponded to the 2008 economic collapse. Like this, I didn't start making this work. I, I, I started making work in this vein before that happened, but like I really started to work out my ideas right around the time that started happening. Uh, so I grew up in Chicago, which is uh, almost became a post, well, it is a post-industrial city, but it almost became like a, like a failed post-industrial city. And so I realized that um, part of why I'm attracted to those kind of spaces is maybe it's like familiar from my childhood. Um, and so I decided to look at um, other cities that um, their economy wasn't based on industrialization. Uh, they were based on what economists and uh, public thinkers at the time thought was a more durable economic model, which is the service economy. And right around the time I was making this, um, home, uh, Las Vegas was the home for closure capital of the United States. So um, I thought that was a, I'll just say, I'll say it's an interesting contrast between sort of the failure of the, this economic model that was um, profited as being like uh, better. And um, also uh, I was really interested in uh, the idea of Las Vegas, it's been uh, articulated through like art theorists and cultural people like uh, uh, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi in their book, Learning from Las Vegas. Uh, Jean Baudrillard in his book, America, he did a whole chapter on Las Vegas. But all of these theorists think about Las Vegas as like a site of um, spectacle and like immaterial and symbols. And I think like the economic crisis really made it like a visceral experience for a lot of people. So I was really interested in going there, still applying um, a lot of these 19th century conventions because I think the American, the ideas about Americanness still were really applicable to this place. But I was also interested in, you know, Las Vegas is a place where people work and you know, have to walk down the street. Um, okay, so when I would go to Las, so if there's a, like, so I, I worked on that, that series about Las Vegas for a couple of years. Um, and oftentimes I would fly to Los Angeles, hang out with some relatives and then drive to Las Vegas. I would pass through this town called San Bernardino, California, which is the Inland Empire, um, a county or, Inland Empire, uh, San Bernardino County. Um, and in the process of working on my series about Las Vegas, actually San Bernardino became the home foreclosure capital. So it moved further west. Um, and, uh, and so then that became subject matter for more work. Um, and uh, I just spent a lot of time there doing research for this body of work. Um, and also San Bernardino is not the story about the economic collapse of 2009. It's a sort of longer story um, about uh, just the slow closing down of industries in uh, you know, the, the area east of Los Angeles, the sort of like the buildup of a steel mill and the, you know, the, and other industries, the closing of military bases. Um, I, I could go into like a lot more detail, but we're short on time. Uh, but anyway, I um, made this work. I tried to actually as much as possible um, interact with people in San Bernardino and sort of learn about their own perceptions of, of, of the city. And eventually this uh, work culminated in an exhibition in San Bernardino. Like I wanted to get feedback if possible from people there. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that, that got cut off because there was a, 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 a big crime that happened there. And so people were more focused on that when it came time to actually get more sustained feedback. Um, so my next body of work, uh, which is actually one of the smaller ones and more recent, um, I was invited to participate in an exhibition in uh, Camden, New Jersey. Uh, at the uh, uh, Rutgers, Rutgers University Camden campus, which is a town across the river from Philadelphia. And um, 
it's a really interesting, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting place. Like if you're into like labor history, um, like it, you know, there was like a sort of landmark period of like unionization that started at the RCA factory in Camden um, and, and other things. But I, I mean, I think of Camden as actually like kind of an archive of like failed urban renewal strategies. Um, and, and like, if you walk around, you can like see like, oh, in the sixties, they were trying to build these tower blocks and concentrate people. And in the seventies, they were doing this other thing and you can see sort of like the remnants of that. Um, and, and then there's always like a new uh, solution <laughs> that's on the horizon. Um, but for this, I actually wanted to make images based on stories that people who lived in Camden themselves told me about Camden. Like I wanted to understand it. So I, I have a lot of anxiety about sort of beaming into a city, um, rendering my judgment, <laughs> making art and then beaming out. Um, and I, I'm, I think that there are other disciplines that have had long historic conversations about like what's like ethical way of sort of handling that like documentary filmmakers, mostly documentary filmmakers, uh, photographers, etc. Um, but I think for what I'm doing, like not only is what I'm doing kind of like a weird new media. Um, I don't I don't have a lot of models for people who use uh, visual effects software. So I'm kind of like adapting from what I know and then what I can intuit. So I decided to, for this, to like wholly invest in what other people were telling me. I'm not completely unplugging from what I'm seeing myself, but I'm letting them um, guide me more. Um, so I actually ended up uh, interviewing people like in a kind of more formal way and what that would entail is I could take people to lunch and have like these really long conversations with them. And these are people I would find through a friend of a friend kind of deal. Um, the, the people that I, I didn't interview a huge amount of people, not as much as I would like to, but um, uh, the, the, I was expecting a wide range of perceptions about Camden, but actually they were all like roughly pretty similar. It's the story of white flight and um, and how the, the the white flight sort of corresponded with the loss of jobs in Camden. Um, anyway, so a lot of these images uh, speak about that, in my opinion, in different ways. Like I probably it's um, a little more metaphorical. So in, in this image, for instance, the buildings in the back are. Um, based on architectural renderings of some development that was being proposed to solve, like the, the new generation solution to solving the poverty problem and unemployment problem in Camden. So I got online and researched the, the people who had bid on like developing the riverfront and incorporated their buildings. Um, but anyway, that was specifically in reference to something that came up in the conversations that I had where um, I think there was like, so I would have these like long conversations, but I always steer it to two questions. Like one is give me an anecdote that, that, you, that you think um, communicates what your notion of, of Camden is. And then the second question I would ask is like, well, what do you think Camden is gonna be like 10 years from now? And so this particular person told me he thought Camden was gonna uh, improve because of this development that was coming down the road. Um, and this is a more of a metaphor for the white flight that people were preparing for. Like one of the things, one of the stories that the few people that I talked to kept referencing was a, a riot or protest, depending on your, your uh, perspective that happened in Camden. I think I used to know the dates when I was like working in this more, but I think it was like the late eighties. Um, so there had been like a consistent white flight happening. And then there was like a, as always the shooting or choking by the cops. And then there was a protest or riot. And, and then that was sort of like the bell when there was a big flood of people that left uh, Camden and which uh, made Cherry Hill, New Jersey, like the sort of like uh, place where former Camden people made like an upper middle-class suburb. Um, so yeah, the boats on the roof sort of reference people preparing for this uh, catastrophe that had been discussed. 
So this is my current body of work. And um, so it is based on, so this is the first body of work that I've made that is not tightly based on like one specific city, but rather based on um, uh, all the cities that I've visited in the last couple of years. Um, and so one part of that like rethinking of like what got me started down this path was um, American cities don't by and large don't really look like what I was making work about when I started making this work. Like if you see an empty and abandoned building in Philadelphia, that means like a developer is trying to get their hands on it. Um, and one of the, the ubiquitous things I see in cities in like all the corners of it is like construction cranes. Um, so I, 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 I just think that things are so, so my, the subject matter of my work are construction sites and buildings that are either being disassembled or buildings that are being uh, reassembled. And um, one of the things I've been thinking about is how, um, I mean, there's like that cliche that uh, art, like making like architecture is a form of optimism. Like you hear variations of that, but um, I, think, I think what uh, buildings are is really like a, an idea of like a social model, right? Like what you think society is gonna be like or what you hope it to be like. And so I'm, I'm really, I guess I've always thought about like the tearing down of buildings is sort of like clearing out like an idea of a past way of life or a social model. Um, but now I'm thinking about like, what is, what is replacing them? Um, another thing that I'm doing a little bit differently in these images, I'm using a drone to scan some of the buildings. So I actually um, fly drones around buildings now and generate 3D models. <clears throat> so some of this is a mixture of models that I modeled by hand, like, and then models that were generated by a drone and software and then models I buy online. So like I can buy um, uh, buildings from like some 3D modeler in Russia and, and plunk them into my scene and integrate it in some kind of way. Uh, so I'm still playing around with the conventions of 19th century American landscape painting. Like I still have uh, the sort of sublime skies that um, were meant to communicate a land that was blessed by God. Um, and also uh, uh, imagery that plays around with the notion of like wilderness or, um, or, or nature, depending on your perspective. Um, So yeah, that building in the middle is from uh, uh, lower lower Manhattan. Uh, the some people call it the Beehive. Um, that's meant to be like a public park, and it's been uh, uh, controversial because it's a building that is meant to be for the public, but a lot of people interpret it as like a you know designed for hedge fund managers. Uh, and so that's like a building I bought online to. Put into the image, and then some of the uh, some of the buildings to the right are uh, buildings I drone scanned from uh, buildings in East St. Louis and in St. Louis. Then this is just to give you a sense of scale of some of those images. All right, that's it. Thank you. Tim, so I would love, I know we have um, a couple questions which we'll get to, but I would love if you wanted to go back to boat and we could talk a little bit more about that work since it is in the exhibition and I personally get lots of questions about it. So it'd be great to hear more about it um, from you. I think especially the presence of the boats because I know there's a specific reason for that. So if you want to talk a bit more about this work, uh, I think that would be great because I know, I think I see some people on here who I think have would have questions about this. Okay. So uh, part of the inspiration, you know, I do a lot of research before I go to go to the places that I visit. Of course, I continue to do research as I visit them. Um, but I initially did a, um, one of my searches on Google, I found an image of a yacht or sailboat that had been graffitied, which really uh, impacted, like it really made an impression on me and I wanted to it seemed to fit within this idea of people preparing to flee. And I also like, like the kind of like reference to Noah and the Ark, like this idea that um, 
this big disaster is going to come and like we're going to prepare and leave and, and have uh, we're the chosen people that are going to like survive this this catastrophe um, and so that that that's kind of the basic premise or inspiration for the work um, but aside from that like these are all buildings that like if you live in Camden New Jersey well there's some buildings that if you lived in Camden New Jersey you would recognize like really um, uh, like the condo building that's sort of in the center in the background um, that has like uh, signage on it. Like that's an actual building in um, downtown Camden that's like very prominent and very visible from like all parts of the city. And it's uh, been in, I don't know, under construction for like, the, <laughs> I feel like 15 years or so. Um, and then there's, you know, buildings like uh, that maybe people wouldn't recognize, but are like kind of like typical looking that you would see in Camden. Um, and that's, that's, I, again, I, I constructed this using uh, 3D, 3D software. Um, so, I mean, I think if you're able to see this in person, like, I think like you can actually see like you can tell a lot more easily that it was computer generated. Um, there's a lot of like uh, artif like digital artifacts in the image, um, like the 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 what we call like the resolution quality of different parts of the image are like not consistent. So like maybe the left like one of the walls and like one of the buildings on the left looks very low resolution. And then like maybe the building in the foreground has like very high resolution um, imagery on, on it. Um, I, I kind of like the, the ability to see or be aware of um, that these, these images are constructions, right? So like I'm, so even though I'm like playing around with like conventions of realism, like, you know, visual rhetoric that's meant to make you believe this exists, I, I am kind of like undermining myself a little bit by saying, you know, this is actually um, constructed and like to a larger extent, like a subjective uh, assertion. I don't, I don't know, like what, I mean, are there specific things that like you think I should talk about? I don't know, I just care, I think because um... Uh, and I can share, I can screen share one of the other works uh, that's in the exhibition. There's three. I think of the three together, this one I it stands out a bit because of sort of um, the like fanciful but also ominous nature of just the boats themselves on the roof. Because as you noted, that sort of allusion to a flood, mm -hmm. it kind of leaves you wondering if the flood has happened or if the people are preparing for it. You know, based on where the where the um, structures kind of are, um, uh, in terms of the being on the roofs. Um, mm -hmm. But I also we did just get a question that I think is a good segue because I did notice in another work uh, I saw some dogs. I think in one of the um, Philadelphia works, but there's no figures mm -hmm. anywhere, and so it's mm -hmm. obviously purposeful. So can you talk a little bit about? The lack of figures in in these landscapes and in these worlds that you're creating. Sure. So I I have a another another thing that I have anxiety about is imagery of people are in distress. And I'm not I don't I'm not saying that you can't have them in your work. I just think that it's something that you have to be really careful with. Like my my fear is like hanging a picture of someone who's homeless or making someone up that's homeless and like hanging it on the wall in a gallery for people's sort of artistic pleasure. Like, I don't, I don't wanna be in that situation. Um, I feel like the architecture sort of uh, is an artifact of people who are in those situations or a reference like a social system that generates those kinds of situations. So I, I you know, I don't, I don't, so yeah, that's why I sort of steer clear of that. Um, but I do like to include things like dogs and statues as another way for people to sort of enter into 
um, the image. I mean, like, again, the architecture does that, but then I want to also include other ways of doing that. Um, another, another thing that happens, I mean, I put dogs in the work um, and only in, in like a particular uh, era of time that I was making this work. Um, during the home foreclosure crisis of 2008, um, a lot of people had to leave their homes. And often like what, what happened in that period was a lot of people just like let their pets go and roam the streets. And so uh, like cities like Philadelphia, like Philadelphia is a cat city. Like there's just tons and tons of feral cats like roaming the streets. In fact, I, I have one. <laughs> um, and um, there was like a brief window of time when it became a dog city. And in fact, um, in one of my excursions to photograph empty buildings, I was chased by a very large pack of, of dogs. Um, uh, and, and I decided to incorporate them because I felt like that you know, was a marker of a lot of things. Um, in one of those images, um, I wanted, you can see dogs in the lower right-hand corner. Um, so, uh, you know, like a, it's, it's kind of funny, uh, but um, America was a colony. And I think that the, you know, as Americans, we, we are not aware of it, but we did for a long period of time, our behavior was sort of governed by that reality. Um, like if you go to Australia or New Zealand, like you can see um, similarities or affinities that uh, like, colon like Western colonies have between each other. And like when I was looking at art in New Zealand and Australia, uh, the lands their landscape tradition um, it sort of made me recognize those aspects to our uh, our landscape tradition. So there's a big part of um, landscape with this just demonstrating what are the distinctive flora and fauna of um, the colony. And often, you, you know, you look at like uh, Frederick Remington, like he's kind of like this corny artist, but he's he is kind of the tail end of that, believe it or not. Um, and you know, other other artists from that Hudson River, like later in the Hudson River Valley School, they're always showing like an animal or some unique animal to the, you know, the West, and then some landscape feature that only exists in America. Um, and so me using the dogs was, you know, my way of showing for this image specifically, like the flora and fauna of the post-industrial city. So that's another way I was thinking about it. I think also, um because there aren't people in any of the images, but like you said, there's these moments where as a viewer, you're not sure uh, are the animals and plants uh, sort of coming back to life to kind of retake over this landscape? Are they sort of the last vestiges of life? Um, and so I think it like rides that line of like a post-apocalyptic film. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's like post-apocalyptic. Um, so I, I think like uh, people have interpreted the, I mean, I think, I think like the work is just kind of like, I, you know, if I can be objective about my own work, I think it's like may be a little provocative. So some people interpret this as like science fiction or um, post-apocalyptic or fantasy or you know, like a like a static version of the wire or something. Um, I think I think for me, how I'm thinking about the work is, I think when we walk down the street, there's a lot of things going on, and I think that because there's so many things going on, we we are less, uh, we we notice some things less than maybe we should. And so I think one of the like basic conceits when I started making this work is I, I, I believe that there was within the inhabited city of Philadelphia, there existed an uninhabited city of Philadelphia. And I wanted to draw people's attention to the uninhabited part to get a sense of the scale. So part of my thinking was at least up until the most recent body of work was it was almost like a sort of lazy version of like data visualization, like it's like, okay, guys, I'm gonna take all this stuff out that's interfering with us seeing like this uh, fact, right? It was just like a lot of empty buildings and like, let's focus on like how that got there. Well, we actually have a question that 
kind of segues between um, what you just said, but your earlier kind of a break or a evolution between your earlier work and the current work. Um, this question is from Leslie, uh, who asked, your earlier work seems more dystopian, whereas the more recent work has what look like small heterotopias. Is this meant to be ironic or is it merely a change in the archive of the built environment? Well, I would say with the last body of work, like I was saying, I think I'm, I'm thinking more. I'm thinking more about the idea of architecture as the positing of a social model, and that different buildings are slightly different uh, takes on like the society that we live in now, or what we what we are hoping to make happen. Um, so. Uh, I think I, if I understand the term heterotopia correctly, um, that's that's why like that that might that's why that's there. Um, I would think that so. I also think like the newest body of work is the first body of work where I'm actually showing things that are being built, um, and I don't necessarily think that. The, the newest body of work is like more optimistic or more pessimistic. I think it's more of a continuation of this idea that um, that there's a, a, a different, like a, a, an American national identity that's in contrast with sort of like lived experience. I don't know if I answered your question, but if, so if you wanna ask like a follow-up, I would. Yes, Leslie, if you have, if you want any clarification. Actually, there was a question about just what you just started talking about, which is about this idea of architecture as optimism um, and, and whether you felt that your new work were, or your work in general reflected that, um, which I think you've just answered. But I do think that that is an interesting uh, relationship between your saying you know, your new body of work for the first time you're putting in things that either are being built or are imagined to be built or people are hoping will be built. Um, and that contrast to uh, 19th century landscape painting, which you set up so nicely in sort of your introduction um, of sort of that idea of Manifest Destiny where you had these, uh, you know, European new American artists coming into a landscape that was not theirs and claiming it as theirs through various ways, which one of the main things was art. Um, and so I wonder if kind of your thoughts on that, of the idea of like art shaping the landscape, even if it is quote unquote realism, um, because it's framing it through an artistic lens and then how you see your own work, maybe shaping perspectives of a landscape since they're a bit reality and a bit fantasy. That's it. I, you know what, I, I don't, I guess I've never thought about that. Like how does my work sort of inform what, how other people, if I understand the question, like how does my work inform other people's understanding of landscape? Yeah, I think, well, I just, I mean it more in the sense that, you know, we're a, such a visual culture. We always kind of have that. And so in the 19th century, you had to wait a long time for the paintings to travel around. And it was like these big to do's when a beautiful, like huge beard stot would travel the country and people would go see this painting. And so now we obviously have a lot more access, but people still shape their perspective, their um, perceptions of, of especially places or people through how they see them in images. So sometimes that's media, right. media representation, and sometimes that's through artwork. So I kind of wonder how you see your role in that. Right, right, right. I mean, I would love it if I could, if I could like really believe that I'm going to shape people. I, I would love to shape people's perceptions of how they see, see the landscape. I think that my work, I've, I've just had so many like, de like well-meaning debates with people who argue that what I'm talking about doesn't really exist. Um, that, you know, I, I've had people come to Philadelphia and like the work, but doesn't, they don't see or believe that the places that I'm describing 
really exist, or they, they get hung up on that it's an exaggeration, not um, a visualization or um, focusing your attention on an aspect that is not as um, accessible. Um, I mean, I, that, that, that would be my goal, right, is to um, hopefully get people to see the landscape from a different perspective, but I feel like um, I'm, I'm like, I feel like being an artist is, you know, depending on what kind of artist you are, um, I, I'm still like working with or against sort of media images that have been the history of images that have already existed. And like that period of time that you were talking about where like Bierstadt would like spend two years on a painting and it would like tour Europe for 10 years or whatever, like there is just so many fewer images, right? So like you could say like this painting of the Swiss Alps was like Yosemite National Park and people would believe it. Yeah, they would um, know. So, so I, yeah, I just, I feel like I'm, I'm, I think there's like different amounts of time that people spend with artwork. Like, and ideally like if, if people like your work they'll go through all the different phases. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if, people are like, like the work that will maybe get to the point where they think about um, the landscape tradition and their experience in the city. But yeah, I've had just so many arguments with people over like how this does or does not um, correspond. I think I, I like borrowing convention. I mean, I, I, I like the conventions of the 19th century. Like, it's just very appealing to me. Like they're, they're generated to be spectacles to draw people's attention. Um, but for me, I, I just like, it just affords me the opportunity to um, make a, a, a statement about something. Right? Yeah. I definitely think so. So we actually are getting a few more questions. So I think I'll take the last two or three that we have. Um, but this is an interesting uh, one. It's something I realized I hadn't asked you. Um, this person wants to know um, why you choose to display your work in galleries and museums as 2D images when they're built with 3D modeling programs. So I guess sort of that, that balance between you know, if you're creating a digital work and then making it analog for viewership. So, you know, that, that's, that's a huge part of my background also. Like, um, so I actually did spend a long time, well, maybe now it's not a long time, but I did spend several years, like, believe it or not, in the early 2000s, I, I got another master's degree in virtual reality technology and which is basically computer game technology like so I made a lot of projects and spent many many hours um, making interactive narratives where you walk through the space um, I think the like when you give the viewer um, more control over like how they see things in the space um, that gives me less ability to um, uh, make the points that I want to make. So like all the conventions that I'm working with are tied to a really specific art uh, genre. And I think it would be a lot harder to uh, use those conventions in an effective way if the user has control over how they see things. And I think like at the point that you're walking around space, at least in a like a 3D virtual space, um, like then we're starting to talk about like a different uh, narrative strategies, you know, like, um, you know, the, the, the artist becomes the author and really what you're doing is you're making like a rule set and like the, the, the for the, the viewer user to operate within. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I just feel like the, the work, the things that I'm thinking about become very different. One, I, I would say like when I was in grad school, I did actually make a piece about post-industrialization that did script the, scripted the user as a factory worker in the last factory in the United States. Um, and uh, you had to, like, you, you had your boss would tell you over the loudspeaker to do different tasks in the factory. 
that you would earn money and then you would go on the environment outside of the factory and spend the money on things um, that, that you actually were making in the factory. Um, and, and then you would have to go back to work to earn more money. So like that, I mean, that was, I think in that period of my life, I was like still playing around with the same themes, but it was like a very different way of approaching them. That's really interesting. That's just life, right? <laughs> Depending on. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think I think that's always interested me is like showing like a I mean that's what art is right it's like you're showing people like a different version of what they're experiencing right but it is a very different experience I think someone who works in an industry where they are physically you know producing especially consumer goods that they then also themselves need or buy it's mm -hmm. a much more interesting relationship than uh, someone you know the the industry that we're in which is education and culture. Um, we're producing content, surely, but right. it is experienced or consumed, for lack of a better word, in different ways by different people. So it's we don't quite understand it the same way as others do. Because, right. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Um, so I'm going to, I think we have time for just one more question. So I'm going to ask Ashley the first question that we got, because I thought it was a good way to end. And then I'm also going to bifurcate the question to have two parts to it, because uh -oh. We can't, we can't not um, address this, but Catherine was wondering how uh, COVID and the events of 2020 have changed your view on the importance of art making or if they have, and if so, in what ways? Um, and then I would like to know, maybe this actually could be answered first, how you're looking at your work differently, you know, because you noted especially that this work really arose in 2008, which was very much, uh, um, in this time of an economic crisis and where we are in and entering that by all um, professional accounts now and how you're looking at your new body of work in light of this year. So first question, how this year has impacted the next body of work and then how you, this changed your whole relationship to art making if it has and in what ways? I, I, that That's a good question and it's also a tough question because I, I feel like to, to answer that, like, like tr to really answer that, we'll have to wait like another two or three years. You right. know, like, I'm, I'm, you know, I think a lot of people in the academia, because I'm a professor, uh, are probably wondering like how much of this like Zoom stuff is going to actually like persist after Zoom is over, um, and like what other similar sort of things are going to stay. I think. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I would say like, you know, I spent a couple of years working on the images that I made for the latest body of work. Um, it, it, it sort of was based on the premise that the economy was, you know, booming um, and, uh, you know, there was low unemployment. And so, uh, and so like the idea of like no one being on the street was not gonna mean the same thing that it actually means to us now, right? Um, and so I became very aware of, I mean, I'm always thinking about like the, you know, the popular context or the social context or whatever we're going through being the context through which we understand work, artwork, right? But um, boy, did that get in my face <laughs> with, with this work. So, I mean, I, it, it totally would make sense to me if someone would go, so this work is hanging up at a museum right now in St. Louis. Um, and it would totally make sense for me, to me, if someone went in the museum and thought the work was about COVID because there's no one on the street. Because there was like a three month period in St. Louis when there was like nothing moving on the street but Amazon trucks. Um, uh, so I, I, I guess like the thing I've, I've been thinking about is how it recontextualized my work. I mean, it's not like, uh, in a bad way, but definitely, um, I don't know. That's that, I, I think that's 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 the extent. I'm also thinking about. Um, I've always been, I've always questioned like showing work in white cubes. Not necessarily that it's always bad or it's always good, but thinking about other places that or other. Uh, mediums like in the tradition of like distribution that work can be shared with the public and I've all you know I've always 
um, you know, even going back to like being a muralist versus a studio painter, like how like you have different audiences depending on like what what context you put, you insert your work. Um, and and so like and now I'm really thinking about that again. It's like I'm putting all this time into making these big images and you know it's it's a dice roll if people can go this week to see it in person or or what. So I don't know. I mean that's those are really specific things I'm thinking about, right? But again, like I was saying, you know, the real question is like, what are we gonna take away from this that's gonna linger two and three years from now? Um what was the second question or did I answer, did I, I don't know if I compounded, no, you answered did. both I think, of them. I, I, think you answered, I think you answered both of them at the same time, which is, that's how our brains are all working now, right? It's all the things at the same time. Um, but I think that that's a, a great like final note is you're saying like needing space from things to be able to represent it or, or think about it and, um, the acknowledgement, as you said, that the, that circumstances change or that context can change the meaning of the work, which, you know, we see that so much in historic art where you have to try to consider the context in which it was made because all art was at once contemporary. And then you're often looking through it through your own modern lens and it um, can sometimes be difficult to, um, understand intent versus impact sometimes when there's work that's on touchy subjects especially um and so yeah the just the the chances that this work is is shown in this time period and it feels very much that way and i think that uh, we've even had you know visitors to the courier and, and seeing the work and the work feels very specific and poignant to the current moment um but still, you know, as tremendous and sublime as it would be in any other time. Um, and so it definitely has taken on an additional layer through, through completely outside forces. And so I think that that's um, a really uh, important note that you, you brought up and um, hopefully yeah, more people will get to come see this work in St. Louis for a while. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, hosting this. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, all our questions have basically been answered. Thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Um, this um, talk was recorded and will be on our website. If you wanted to encourage um, friends and family who might have also wanted to come and, and didn't make it to view it later. Um, and like I said, please uh, check our website for all of our most up-to-date information on the museum's hours and safety protocol, but also for lots of virtual programming like this wonderful talk with Tim. Thank you, Tim, for being with us um, and for sharing all this work and being really generous. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.